Is this thing on? Welcome back to Big Mel and fancy seeing you here in June. I very welcome my friends and especially my enemies. Come in, sit down, no touching. I don't do the touching. And welcome to the DCEU Extra. There wasn't supposed to be a DCEU Extra. But then again, I wasn't supposed to be born. My younger sister wasn't supposed to be born. We were both accidents. So things that are not supposed to happen. A pretty perfectionist, aren't they? Aren't they? Anyway, I don't want to. I don't want to know. I don't want to know. Don't don't comment down below about that. So Joe Blow videos. Now Joe Blow is um, a very very interesting guy. He does very interesting takes. He's very passionate about films, and he's got a section on his channel called Unpopular Opinions. And this unpopular opinion video is saying that Justice League is is actually a really good. A fun movie, and he's talking about Joss Whedon's theatrical version. So many of my subscribers are going to be triggered by this. So what we're going to do, I'm going to play the audio for you. I think that's the best way to do it. I'm going to interrupt now and again and give you my view on what he's saying. Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, The Flash, Aquaman, Cyborg. Six superheroes assemble to avenge their world against a cosmic threat of apocalyptic proportions. A team of superheroes as iconic as any in the history of comic books. With a legacy of big screen success for two of these characters and the looming shadow of Marvel Studios' non-stop box office juggernaut, Warner Brothers and DC decided it was their turn for a shared cinematic universe, but one not built on standalone franchises brought together for an event film. After a change in directors and a massive overhaul of the tone of the finished film, Justice League premiered to disappointing grosses and the disdain of many fans. But... Justice League is far But he just shows on that video the Rotten Tomato scores. Now, the critic scores are terrible. But the audience score is 72. 72. 72% of people like that movie. Whenever that video was done, and I'm not quite sure, to be honest. But 72% at that time from the audience score liked Justice League. So let's, before we go back to the video, let's talk about why mainstream audiences liked it. Why my brother took his son, and he, he, his son absolutely loved it. Because it's made for it's made for a family audience. It, it, is, it is MCU'd. That's what they wanted to do. They wanted to make a family movie, and they did. Unfortunately, because they took Zach's movie and tried to turn it into a marvelized film, it became a big problem. You can't do that. My point has always been Joss Whedon to come in and make his own Justice League film. We wouldn't have liked that Zack was off the project. Of course not. It wouldn't have been fair, but at least it would have been more honest and it would have been a more cohesive movie. I will tell you my straight opinion, whether I agree or disagree with him. You know my views about the Snyder Cut and everything, but I'm going to be balanced in my views. Let's continue listening to this video. From the debacle many of you want to believe, especially those holding out hope for a certain cut of the film. In fact, Justice League is a real... Right, just in case you missed it, he says, Justice League isn't the debacle some of us want to believe. Let's see what he's got to say. A fun movie that should have marked the start of something for DC and not the end. I'm Alex Meaty and welcome to The Unpopular Opinion. When Christopher Nolan and David Goyer were wrapping The Dark Knight Rises, they came up with an idea for presenting Superman in a modern context. With the hiring of Zack Snyder and the casting of Henry Cavill, expectations were at an all-time high for this contemporary take. Then, shit blew up. Literally. The catastrophic and 9-11-esque destruction of Metropolis at the end of Man of Steel resulted in a shift of direction for Snyder's sequel, Batman vs. Superman Dawn of Justice. The excitement we all felt knowing we would finally see DC's most famous heroes face off on the big screen was quickly dampened when Ben Affleck was cast as Bruce Wayne. While I always liked the choice and knew Affleck could pull it off, just like every Batman cast before him, fans were not in agreement with the choice. As we soon learned when the film was released, along with the equally despised casting of Gal Gadot as Wonder Woman, the finished product was squarely Zack Snyder's vision for a starker universe than what the folks over at Disney were releasing via Marvel Studios. With Batman vs. Superman a disappointment, even though it did gross $873 million globally, the already in-development Justice League was bound to get blowback. 
Zack Snyder was already ensconced in making a film his way, one that would have seen the eventual introduction of Darkseid, DC's biggest intergalactic bad guy. With Suicide Squad already filmed and released months after Batman vs. Superman, that left Wonder Woman as the sole DC extended universe film before Justice League. Of course, that movie was visually distinct from the look of Snyder's films or Suicide Squad helmer David Ayer and went on to be an unprecedented smash hit. So what does a movie studio do when faced with a financial decision to err on the side of caution and try to marvel shit up or stick with an uncompromising vision? Enter Joss Whedon. The filmmaker who created The Avengers replaced Zack Snyder, who left due to a personal tragedy. It seemed like the most logical choice from an executive standpoint. Bring in the man who helped make Marvel... I want you to think back to something very interesting because thinking about after a thing when you can look back is different to how you were thinking before something plays out. With the trailers we were getting, and I remember the announcement we got that Joss Whedon was taking over. Now, between you and me and the gay post, I was quite excited about this. I thought, you see, I'm a big fan of Warner Brothers. I always will, by the way. Um, and I felt this was a great opportunity. For, for Joss to bring it into the mainstream. I know I'm going to get some kicks here, but I thought it was after the reaction to Batman v Superman, despite, despite me loving the film, I thought this was a great idea. I thought he could put his spin on it. Um, you know, he was very popular with MCU fans. I thought at least we could get the box office. At least we could get the hatred out of the window. And because they were saying he was Zach's friend and Zach brought him on, I just thought it could be, it could have Zach's vision but it could be a Joss Whedon film as well. How wrong can you be? Because Zack Snyder's got his vision. Joss Whedon's got his. There's no way this could have continued to be Zack Snyder's vision. First of all, they cut him from two films to one film. And all of a sudden, Joss Whedon's got to come in and do this film. It's very difficult. It's difficult for Zack Snyder to take. It's difficult for Joss Whedon. Joss Whedon wanted to make his Back Hill movie, and this is why he agreed to do this. But as I say, he should have made his own Justice League movie. This was the only way out. This was a stupid idea. Um, and I will agree with uh, Alex. I will be honest. I do feel that despite what they did to Zack, which was totally wrong, there are elements of this film that are fun, that are exciting, that are interesting. We have a good um, dynamic between Wonder Woman and um, Batman. We have a great dynamic between Cyborg and The Flash. And in the end there, we've got a great little dynamic to put between um, Cyborg and Superman. So there are some interesting things. And it's not Joss Whedon's fault. It's not. He tried to do his best. And there are elements that he did well. And there are elements he did badly. But that's because there was a rush on. And there was pressure on. He should have been allowed to make his own film. Studios universe what it is and see if he could do the same for DC. Several script revisions, reshoots, and mustache-related CGI later, Justice League was ready. No longer the massive first part of an announced two-film story, Justice League was now a slimmed-down blockbuster with a two-hour runtime, far less bloated than either of Snyder's films. Many specifically blame Whedon for the failure of Justice League, both from a critically and commercial standpoint. Complaints were made that it ignored the intended tone of Snyder's films and was just too damn marvel-y. What are your superpowers again? I'm rich. In fact, I found Justice League to be a lot of fun. As the guy who really did not like the first Avengers, Justice League felt like the boost that DC films needed if they intended to create a shared universe. Fun, full of quips, and not too serious, it is a movie that you can enjoy without having to weigh the lofty philosophical ideas that Zack Snyder's films delivered with minimal humor. Now this is when he becomes unpopular, and I'm sure he's going to get a lot of hate on this video. Um, he talks about fun, cutting out the philosophical commentary, but that's Zack Snyder. That's what he does. This is how he makes films. So you've got this problematic situation here, right? Because if Snyder stayed on and continued his vision, right, it would have kept on being divisive. Warner Brothers would have kept on losing money. This is, this is the point. I'm not making the money they wanted. And at the end of the day, there has to be a balance between making money and making good films. At the end of the day. Now, Disney do their thing. Now, Disney can do what they do because they're a family studio. 
They are there to make films to tickle people under the chin and make them feel warm inside on a cold day or Christmas. And that's how I use their films, right? I've got all the Marvel films. I don't like Disney because they're doing better than Warner Brothers. And I'm a Warner Brothers fan. I'm a DC fan. I want DC to do well. Uh, so a lot of my hatred for them is actually envy. And I absolutely confess that. He wanted a fun movie but didn't like the first Avengers film. That's interesting. My opinion on the first Avengers film is it's not as amazing as people said it was. But it was the first live action team up film. And people liked that aspect so much they forgot the fact that it was okay. But nothing particularly special. It was okay. The Hulk was the best thing about it as far as I'm concerned. But we're not talk here to talk about the first Avengers. We're here to talk about the first and only Justice League movie. So because he wants that, he wanted that. That's why he's saying it. He's saying he enjoyed the movie because that's what he wants from a superhero movie. They, you know, these critics and pundits keep on talking about fun. Now, do I, what do I think about a team-up? What should a Justice League team-up be? Well, if you read lots of Justice League graphic novels, some of them are bright and tickle you under the chin, and some of them are very, very dark. Look, this is the choice Warner Brothers had. They had, they had fallback after Man of Steel, but... Because Man of Steel was more mainstream and more popcorn-y than Batman v Superman was, they kind of got away with it. It made an okay, solid amount of money, but again, I think Warner Brothers feel that Superman movies should be making around eight hundred to a billion dollars, uh, and, and I agree with them now. Um, so already there was some divisiveness. I think the problem Man of Steel had was the killing Superman, killing Zod, and I mean we can go back and forth. I, I'll give you my opinion about that now. If Superman's going to kill Zod, right, because he, the writer gives him no choice, right, when he's at the farm in the penult penultimate scene of the film, when he's talking to his mum about his dad, he's, she's got to ask him, how did it feel to kill someone? And then Superman turns around and says something like, it's a feeling. I've never felt this way, that way before. And it's a feeling I don't ever want to feel again. That's all you have to do. And I promise you everyone's going to say, so that's why they did it. So Superman knows what it's like to kill. And so that he doesn't do it again. Because it is basic. Man of Steel is basically Superman begins. He hasn't had his training yet. And also in Batman v Superman. There's something they could have done a bit more. He, could, he should have started his training. He didn't have any training. Superman's always had training by jor right? So they should have found a way for him to have training um, in Batman v Superman. But again, Batman v Superman is more of Superman begins. Now... And eventually, he's got to get his training. Now, maybe in Man of Steel 2, that's what they were looking to do. And there's another issue. There is no fortress of solitude. And I know I know the ship is supposed to be... But you've got to have a fortress in a Superman film. Now, again, don't get me wrong. I love Man of Steel and I love Batman v Superman. But even things we love, everything we love is made by human hands. And anything made by human hands is flawed. And we should always feel comfortable um, talking about those flaws that we feel are flaws without feeling threatened by other people. That's just my opinion. Let's continue with this video. Now, not all movies have to follow the Marvel formula. And Justice League certainly doesn't obey it wholeheartedly. But it does work in taking the grimness down a notch and letting us once again have fun with these characters. In Batman vs. Superman, both Clark Kent... See, he talks about grim. But I, see, this is the thing for me. I don't see, it depends it depends on your point of view. I don't see Man of Steel and Batman v Superman as grim. Yes, it is a darker world because it's set in the real world. Uh, this metropolis and this Gotham are meant to be a reflection of how hardcore the real world is and how, you know, how when you get hurt in the real world, it's really, really bad. And that's what they wanted to do. Now, the question is, should superheroes be based in the real world? Well, it kind of works for a lot of people, for the Snyder fans, for the, for the Boys fans, you know, from the Amazon series as well. Um, you know, there's some people who like that. But you've got to decide as a studio, are you going to go down this realism and take a lot of money away from yourself? Or are you going to let the, the creativeness and the artistry do the talking? And if you don't make the billions and two billions that Disney made per movie, you're fine with that. Clearly, Warner Brothers wasn't fine with that because they never chose to bring in Snyder. They've chosen to bring in Christopher Nolan to make some of the films, and Christopher Nolan just wanted to godfather. He didn't want to get his hands dirty with a franchise. And this is where it all fell to pieces when he said, I need to bring someone to have eyes and ears for me because I don't want to mould the clay myself. He brings in Snyder. By bringing in Snyder, there was always, all, all, 
There was a divisive opinion about Snyder already, not by me, but by people who didn't like his adaption of Watchmen. So the hatred was already there. So there was already a big problem. So once Warner Brothers realised that Nolan didn't want to get his hands dirty and mould the clay himself, they should have brought somebody in to do that. Now, Walter Hamada is doing that right now. Now, whether J.J. Abrams is going to take over that job or not is very exciting, and only the future can tell for that. And Bruce Wayne were caught in the moral quandaries of what happened during the fight between Superman and General Zod in Man of Steel. Batman's xenophobia was allayed when he learned that the Martha connection existed, which turned his perspective on suits completely around. Here, Batman is a stoic hero past his prime who needs to set up the next generation of crime fighters who will eventually take his place. Ben Affleck brilliantly portrays his Bruce Wayne as a man coming to terms with his own mortality. Recognizing what Superman represents, this Batman is still learning how to be a team player while surrounded by a team infinitely more powerful than he is, yet dramatically more inexperienced. We have never seen a Batman like this before on screen, and it was a breath of fresh air after having already seen his origin on the screen twice before. Gal Gadot's Wonder Woman, who became a symbol as the first female superhero to headline her own film, here continues to show strength and leadership almost more than Batman, as she helps form the titular Justice League. While she was coming to terms with her place in the human world in her solo film, Wonder Woman is older and wiser here. While the upcoming Wonder Woman 1984 will surely give us more insight into how Diana continued to grow into her persona, Justice League shows us a woman who has lived in our world for so long and knows the threat that Steppenwolf and the Mother Boxes represent. Like Thor in the Avengers films, Wonder Woman brings an ethereal quality to the team and can hold her own with anything they need to face. See, what this guy is doing is looking at this film in a positive way and spinning it in a positive way. And I've done that myself when I thought about it. I've tried to put a positive spin on this theatrical release. Now, I, I can only tell you how I felt after I saw the movie because you see the trailers, you see an epic movie and you go there and you see something that's... The, opposite, the total opposite to Epic. It's quick, it's easily solved, and you know what? That doesn't make it a bad film. I get it. A lot of kids would have gone, watched it, ate their popcorn, and enjoyed it. I get it. I understand the 72% audience score on Rotten Tomatoes. I totally do. But for me, as an adult, I expected something. I expected more of the same what I saw in Man of Steel and Batman v Superman, and there lies the problem. But it goes beyond that. It's not about whether they should have made a Marvel popcorn chomping movie or continued on Zack Snyder's direction. What you do not do is basically drive someone out after asking him three or four times to tone down and water down his project and his content. Please ignore my phone. Why didn't I get rid of it anyway? So, yeah. So that was the problem. They took a man's film, they cut it to pieces and they watered it down. That's everybody's issue. The issue shouldn't be whether dark is better than light or light is better than dark. That's a conversation that can be had. And the Snyder fans will say dark is better and, you know, realism is better. And other people will say, do you know what? I want my DC universe a bit more inspirational, a bit more lighter with gags. I, I, want, it, I, want, I want it free and easy. I want to be tickled under the chin. That's what some people think. Not me necessarily. I'm just saying. But the wrong thing that happened here, so it's more about what they did to Zach or what they did to his film rather than the final product. The final product has terrible CGI because they rushed it. You cannot present a film in that condition to audiences. It was disgusting and it's embarrassing. And just for that, we should we deserve to see the Snyder cut. Now, I'm not arguing with him in the context that it is a fun entertaining movie. I love the the, the pre-Superman uh, and Flash race. I think Ezra Miller's brilliant. He touches on that in a minute. Let's continue. She also recognizes the hesitancy in her colleagues, namely Cyborg. While Ray Fisher had many scenes cut from the final film, this take on Cyborg is one I greatly enjoyed. Questioning his own humanity after his father used the mother box to save his life, by the end of the movie he has a similar arc to Captain Marvel and has grown into his abilities, coming to terms with what was done to him. Fisher plays Cyborg in a relatively understated way that makes him fun to watch, but also leaves the door open to experience more in the future. At the same time, Ezra Miller's Barry Allen is the scene stealer of Justice League. Already a fan favorite thanks to the very fun CW series The Flash, this Barry Allen is played more as a nebbish young man. 
He's obsessed with things being fun, isn't he? So already you know that this guy... Now, he, he says later on that he actually loves what Henry Cavill did with Superman. So that's great. And I mean, if he doesn't like it, he doesn't have to. We can't all have the same opinions. But he's obsessed with fun. Um, he's right about Ray Fisher, by the way. I think his performance is brilliant. I think he's a great cyborg. And I think Cyborg is great in this movie. What's wrong about Cyborg in this movie is that his scenes were cut and we would have got, you know, a, 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 a more fleshed out character with what Zach and Terrio and Goya did. Do you know what I mean? So, you know, that's the sadness for me. And that's the disappointing aspect. It's not whether or not Whedon did a good job. We Look, let's be honest here. Whether you like this film or not, Whedon did a great job considering he came in, he had to cut the film down to two hours, film his own scenes, write his own scenes, and get it out by November. That's extremely pressure. That's extreme pressure for a, for a creative. This is what, it's not totally his fault. He came in to do Batgirl, and they said, do this, and you can have Batgirl. That's the problem. The whole thing was wrong, and we all know that. This goes beyond whether Justice League is a movie that you like or not. We exist on the autism spectrum. Without making fun of those with Asperger's or similar diagnoses, Miller uses his comedic timing to make this Flash seem both lighthearted, but the most human of everyone on the team. In many ways, Barry has a similar relationship with Bruce Wayne as Peter Parker did with Tony Stark. The mentor-mentee dynamic set up in this film definitely would have been fun to explore in the future films, and even a team-up between Batman and The Flash could have been awesome. And of course, there's Jason Momoa as Aquaman. While it would... You know what? He makes a good point here. Now, I don't like Captain... I don't like Iron Man being in the Spider-Man films and having this close relationship. I don't like him making Spider-Man suits. It's the whole thing stinks. And the way they've ignored Uncle Ben is disgusting. But, but, I like the Bruce Wayne um, of the Flash dynamic. I like uh, the Batman, the Flash dynamic. And I love the dynamic between Ben Affleck and Ezra Miller. I think it works. And I think it was brilliant. And I would have loved to have, I think he's right. It would have been good in the future of the shared universe. Now, this is interesting because... On today's uh, DCEU Daily, which I did a few hours ago and I posted, I asked, is the DCEU still the DC, DC Cinematic Universe? Is it, is it still a shared universe? And I think it still is because what we saw in Shazam, and I, you know, go and watch that video, make your own minds up. This is what this channel and all channels should be about. People having opinion, and we should never block those opinions out as long as people put those opinions constructively with no death threats or silly things like that. Um... But yes, I, I think he's right. This, I mean, this film basically spelt the end of the kind of overly shared universe. It's, it's going to be less shared. I still think it's going to be shared in places, but they are going for the standalone movies. Now, if and when J.J. Abrams takes over, he may go back to the other formula, and that's going to be very interesting as well. But I do think the dynamic between Bruce and The Flash was very interesting, and I think there was a lot of potential in it. Not be until a year after Justice League that James Wan would show that Aquaman was more than a punchline from Entourage. Here, Momoa shows that the blonde-haired, blue-eyed Arthur Curry is not the only interpretation of DC's Atlantean monarch. Momoa's physical presence and a gruff demeanor has often been written off as the actor just being a slight variation of himself in real life, but it works. Aquaman is the most reluctant hero on the team, but when he's kicking ass, we the audience get to enjoy it as much as he does. Last but not least, we have Henry Cavill's Superman. No matter what anyone says about Man of Steel or Batman vs. Superman, I truly applaud Cavill's take on the role. While both of the prior films give us a Superman finding the balance between his alter egos, his death and resurrection gave Warner Brothers the chance to finally bring some light into his eyes. Despite limited screen time and that painfully bad mustache CGI, Henry Cavill finally looks to be able to have fun playing Superman. From the credit scene race with the Flash, or his arrival in the final battle with Steppenwolf, Cavill looks to be more like Christopher Reeve than ever before, and it made me much more excited than ever to see his next standalone adventure. Which brings us to the elephant in the room, the Snyder Cut. Producers of Justice League have long stated that Joss Whedon filmed less than 20% of the film, with the rest having been completed footage helmed by Zack Snyder. Snyder has taken to his Vero social media account to tease out clues and hints as to what his film would have been and many in Hollywood have said that the Snyder Cut was assembled and screened. What level of completion that cut was in is unknown and likely did not have completed special effects, 
rendering it unreleasable. As Warner Brothers and DC prepare the next phase of their films, including Joker, The Batman, Birds of Prey, and more, the necessity of existing in a shared cinematic universe is no longer relevant. If Joker goes on to win Best Picture at the Academy Awards, that will without a doubt seal the fate of the DC Extended Universe. And, at the end of the day, that will be the biggest tragedy of all. Whether or not a Snyder Cut ever sees the light of day is a moot point, because the Justice League we got is the only movie that matters. It may not be the film that audiences all wanted, but that doesn't mean it isn't a fun movie. Justice League is a movie that serves as a wide-open introduction to these DC characters, the vast majority of whom we had never seen on the big screen before. When compared to Marvel Studios, it's easy to write this movie off as a failure. The only mistake that I find with Justice League is that it in any way discounts Man of Steel or Batman vs. Superman as Warner Brothers continue to try course-correcting midstream. Is it an uneven film? Yes. Could it have been handled better if it had been left alone and released as Zack Snyder had originally intended? We may never know. But just because Snyder's cut exists does not mean that it is better. Different, yes, but that does not mean superior. The Justice League we do have is a visually stunning achievement that showcases what DC Comics has to offer, and it is more than enough to go up against what Marvel Studios is capable of. But hey, that's just my unpopular opinion. Tell us yours in the comments below. I'm Alex Mady with JoeBlow.com. Well, I'll tell you what, guys. I like Joe Blow. I don't agree with... Look, this is the problem. This is what you're up against. You've got the Marvel Cinematic Universe over there. You've got the DCEU there. You've got Batman v Superman, Man of Steel, and um, Suicide Squad down there. And then you've got Wonder Woman, Aquaman, and Joker movie about to happen. So there's all these different opinions. And having opinions about the DCEU is more exciting than having opinions about the MCU because it's such a... It's such a um, divisive topic with the DCEU. That's what makes every DCEU movie so fascinating because they're all very different, right? And they're all very interesting films. And uh, I loved a lot. Even Justice League, I love the elements of that film. But what they did to Zack and us missing out on Zack's vision was not right and not fair. So he talks briefly about the Snyder Cut. He says... This Justice League film, the one that hit theatres, is the only one that matters because it's the only one that, that exists. It's the only one that, that exists, Alex, because basically it's the only one they released. They cut Zack's film to pieces, then put this out there. Listen, I can watch the Justice League movie. I'm not going to lie. I can enjoy it. I can ignore Henry's uh, bad CG on his lip. I can ignore um, Bruce Wayne's Ben Affleck's awful cringy grin near the end there when Superman turns up. And some of the Superman stuff's pretty awesome when he does turn up. If it wasn't for the bad CGI with the phone scene at the start with the kids, I thought that was kind of a good emotional scene showing us what Superman means to the world. I can live with that. I can live with all that. But what they did to Zack, I can't live with. You know, this, should, this film should have been stopped. After the reaction to Batman v Superman, they should have said, look, Zack, stop it now. Stop making this film. We can't have you as part of this anymore. I'm very, very sorry, Zach, but it's too divisive. We respect you. We like the films ourselves you make, but they are, they are losing us money. We're not making the money. There's so much toxicity and negativity. Now, I still think that's a shame. I, you know, I would have loved to have seen both his Justice League movies. I love his Man of Steel and Batman v Superman um, movies. I love the guy. The guy's unique. He's a great storyteller. But I'm, I'm thinking about Warner Brothers as a company and as a business. They were put in a very difficult situation because they brought Nolan in and he didn't want to mould it. They did, he didn't want to mould the clay. As I said before, that's a problem. So once they knew that, he should have been, no, sorry, uh, Chris, we're going to get someone else in. And Chris would have been fine with that because he still would have made movies with them and stuff like that. As he didn't really want to be involved in the first place, but he did co-write Man of Steel and did a great job with David S. Goyer. So that's where all the problems began. But as soon as you've got the problem with Batman v Superman from a mainstream perspective, making under a billion dollars as a company, you've got to say, do you know what? We respect you. Maybe we'll do something else with you in the future, but please stop filming this film now. We're going to bring in Joss Whedon to do his total new thing. He's going he's to try and continue from Batman v Superman as much as he can, but he's going to course correct what, he, what you've done. And I'm sorry about that, but as a company, we've got to move forward. And that's what they should have done. But doing what they did was a mess, 
And when you hear people talk about it, and you talk, at first, when the film was in the theatre and you hear about the rumours, you think, surely no company as successful and as massive as Warner Brothers would be this stupid. But then I, I, th I think to myself, what would I have done if I was in that position? If I've released two movies that should be the beginning of a great franchise and there's this divisiveness, what would I do? To be honest with you, I don't know.